Hello and welcome to Number One Crude Mistakes with myself, Glenn, from Number One Projects, KJ from Crude But Efficient, and Havard from Behind the Mistakes. I just had a shocking realization whilst listening to our last episode. Because at some point, while discussing the Mona Lisa with the rocket launcher on Glenn's wall, <laughs> he said, if either of you guys want a Banksy, I still have the stencils for that. <laughs> Holy crap, it all makes perfect sense now. <laughs> Glenn having a job outside, alone, without supervision, and access to public areas and in-depth knowledge around tools and paint. <laughs> Glenn is Banksy, isn't he? Oh, that's just ridiculous. I mean, just just because I was in Glasgow where the exhibition was a few weeks ago. <laughs> now that you know we're on to you, officially, <laughs> you will slip up. One of these days you will slip up. <laughs> Yeah, the fake money printing press running in the background. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, sure, Glenn, that's the freezer making sounds. <laughs> oh dear, I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> How are you doing, guys? Doing fine. Brilliantly. KJ, how are you doing? Yeah, I, I always, I always have a problem with that. How are you doing? And I, how, how much detail should I go into? Well, I was fine, but this morning I had a bit of a cough. And no, that's I, too much detail, man. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, <laughs> I, I, I really, I really dread that kind of uh, question because my mind sort of freeze, freezes up, and I, I prefer it when I'm the one asking. But you, you beat me to it this time. Yay! <laughs> I, I've had to rehearse in that uh, Norwegian saying. It's uh, I'm up and not crying. That's uh, <laughs> like the standard response. Yeah, I usually go with it could be worse. Very good. <laughs> well, I think we've covered that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got an elderly neighbour who says, "Well, I woke up this morning." <laughs> <laughs> well then. Uh, yeah. Then you're winning. Yeah. Congratulations, Dick, is what he gets back. <laughs> His name's Dick. I don't just call him funny names. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good here. So have you been busy? What have you been up to? Busy weekends? Yeah, de definitely <laughs> uh, uh, an extremely busy week, but all of it outside the workshop, unfortunately. Um, it's all been uh, work and... Uh, and socializing with people, which is fun and all wow. that, but it gets a bit draining for an introvert like me. Well, we saw some interesting stuff on the socials. It looked like you had a good time. Was it Sunday? Yeah, exactly. Sunday. Uh, Pia from Femke Making, German uh, maker friend, uh, decided to to have a, a weekend in Stockholm and asked, hey, are you free? And of course, you say yes, and then she dragged along Ula from Forty Doors and Daniel from Switch and Lever as well. So we had a little mini maker meetup in Stockholm. Uh, went to a, a flea market and uh, strolled around town in the beautiful weather, and had a lot of Swedish fika. They will say, you know, coffee and uh, and cake, more or less. Okay. <laughs> So that was brilliant. Just uh, walking around for I think about six hours or so. Nice. And I mean, it, a maker meetup doesn't have to be more than that, really. You just have to have more than one maker in one space, more or less. <laughs> I think you're very lucky to be able to meet up with um, other makers. I think you know that's a real treat, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely. And I mean, it's it's a bit sad that it it needs uh, a German invading for us Swedes to actually get together and and meet <laughs> face to face. But hey, are the other two guys far away from you, KJ? Yeah, I think about two hours drive, something like that. So yeah, we're okay. we're pretty scattered. Maybe there's some middle ground you could meet in in the future. Yeah, I think we were more or less. This was the middle ground, so. Oh, okay. Apparently, I, I could be some sort of nexus, but who knows? <laughs> I mean, that, that's the, the hard thing with the, the international maker 
scene that you don't really know where people are situated. And I mean, you have a lot of connections with people in different countries, but as I said, uh, yeah, the, the makers I know are a couple of hours away from me. I mean, maybe there's yeah. someone down the street, but I don't know about it because <laughs> uh, all of these different little campfires on, in the vastness of the darkness that is the internet, you don't really know if there's yeah. another campfire around the corner and you don't really dare to walk out in the in the dark, cold night to find <laughs> something either. No, it's weird when um, when I'm looking on Instagram. Unless there's a flag on somebody's um, bio, I don't I don't even know what country they're from most of the time. You know, sometimes the name will help give you a clue, but most of the time, I've no idea. I thought I actually thought Pempu making was from England until <laughs> until she said on the Instagram the other day she was German. <laughs> so what about you, Havard? Did you uh, did you get a chance to make something at the weekend or do anything? Well, we made a lot of apple juice, actually. Um, we had a family get-together with uh, the extended family, and uh, we picked a lot of apples, uh, and we made juice for the entire day. And then on the way home, we picked up a pump organ, and that's a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Business as usual. <laughs> Business as usual. <laughs> So two two things. Why were you making juice and not cider? Well, and the other thing is, why the hell would you want a pedal powered organ? Uh, why wouldn't you? Yeah, why wouldn't you? <laughs> um, well, to answer there's your... a reason people give them away for free. <laughs> to answer your first question, um, it's more it's not our apples, and yeah, I don't think I would have. 40 plus liters of cider just sitting around. Uh, I think that would uh, wreak havoc on uh, <laughs> my sleep pattern. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have it <laughs> looking around for long. Do you have a, a cider making tradition in Norway? No. Or... Because we, we don't have either. Not At least not nearly as much as, as England. I, th I think we have on the west coast because there is a, like a belt geographically where they have apples and pears. They most likely have a tradition for it. And from there and north, where I'm from, it's a more a moonshining tradition. It's very yeah. much right. like the prohibition in the States. It was illegal. And then you have the the government controlled outlets and so on and alcohol has always been expensive so of course making your own has always been a bit of a tradition have you you guys had a go at making moonshine no 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 <laughs> <laughs> as i said it's strictly forbidden so uh, uh okay <laughs> no actually i did i've known the theory for many years and then I think I was well into my 20s when my father just said that, all right, this is tradition. You should also learn how to do it. And I have a distant cousin who has the equipment. So we arranged for lending that for a couple of weekends. And then we had a production run, purely research driven, of course. And uh, <laughs> that resulted in a tradition where we actually did a moonshine run every Christmas Eve where we started up the morning by just firing up the still. And then, of course, that was just going in the background while we were making all the food and everything. And when time came around for dinner, then we had a batch where we could have like a small, like a celebratory taste. And then we turned the rest into wiper washer fluid because... Basically, that's the <laughs> best use for it. <laughs> Going back to the organ. <laughs> because I find that much more intriguing than hard liquor. <laughs> yeah, let's address the organ in the room. <laughs> <laughs> the huge organ standing in the middle of the room. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, I'm not a maker anymore. I'm a 
I'm an organ player now, obviously, <laughs> um, or apparently. Uh, well, I, I, where do I even start? Uh, don't even know myself, but uh, I know that I, I some time down the line would like to make some sort of an air bellows for the hell quarter and trying to find information on that online i realized there's very limited information on how to actually build air bellows for small to mid-sized organs and all the larger organs where there are a lot of information those are often driven by a separate fan room or something so I just thought, why don't I just get one? And then I just pick it apart and find out how they did it. And then I can see if I can scale it down. And it tur turns out that on uh, one of Norway's online marketplaces, people are actually giving away these left, right and center because they are huge. They're old. Uh, people have probably either inherited them or bought them being optimistically about playing and then they realize that's not going to happen and then just to get rid of it they just give it away so i found maybe 60 different organs being given away across norway and one of them happened to be just a stone's throw away from me so i just sent a message and asked is this still available yeah yeah, of course you can just drop by and pick it up and i did <laughs> <laughs> so now it's in my workshop and it's too nice, actually, uh, and that's a bit of a problem because I was thinking just going to town on it and just turn it into firewood and finding out the nitty gritty of the bellow system. But it really works and it really looks nice. So I'm going to be a, having a more ginger approach to it, trying to save it because then I could use it for another project later, which is also Hellcorder related, but... Uh, yeah, if you're thinking about the Great Balls of Fire of Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, there might be an inspiration <laughs> there. <laughs> Nothing more said. I can see that, yeah. I, I don't think you can lift one foot up on the keyboard and pump those bellows at the same time, though, can you? Well, you can actually pump with one oh, foot, okay. but, uh, <laughs> I mean, motorizing is just the... Is the <laughs> <laughs> least of my problems <laughs> that's a that's a nice video in itself just making something that keeps the pedals going some off center wheel or something like that that's a, a a very large organ to have in your workshop though isn't it i mean i couldn't cope with that in yeah in my workshop um, luckily these these are one of the the examples that i saw that have when you put the lid down it has a flat surface, so I can actually put things on it for the weeks that will probably turn into months where it's going to sit so in my workshop. But it is on a musical workbench. <laughs> <laughs> but it is on casters, and it's very easy to move around uh, as long as it's standing on the floor. So I'll manage Some people to have, get a, have a flip table with a sander. You have a <laughs> you have an organ instead. <laughs> oh, that would be really cool. I could just integrate it yeah. into my workbench. So when people like uh, flip up sanders and spindle <laughs> sanders and so on, then, well, if you flip up on this side, you have a fully working organ. <laughs> <laughs> or hook it up to your dust system. So you have to pump it when you're sanding. <laughs> <laughs> that might clog something, but... Oh. You know. That would be cool if you could automate it to play one tune. So when you turn on your dust collection, it automatically also plays a tune for you because there's nothing more annoying than that droning sound of a vacuum in the background. So if you have an organ playing a <laughs> decent tune, that would be nice. O organs generally don't sound that much better, do they? Very much depends on the player, I would say. As, yeah. uh, in, in my case, no. <laughs> I, I, I did actually do, I recorded some video snippets for uh, the next uh, YouTube video yesterday, and I'm really not an organ player, so I think I ended up with 47 takes to cut down to a 30-second clip. So uh, in the video, it looks like I really know how to play, but... Uh, 
having a YouTube tutorial on my phone in front of me outside of the <laughs> reach of the camera and then <laughs> doing it over and over again. But yeah, I got a comment from my wife sitting upstairs having to listen to that. <laughs> I think it's it's really great. I, I actually dared to, to have a look around on on our local uh, local sites and it, no one was giving it away for free at least. So then I felt a little better because I'm not sure I could resist if I if I had a had something like that turn up. Yeah, because that's it's, I'm not regretting any of it. It's actually it's pure <laughs> joy. I mean, it's it's so ludicrous to have a pump organ in your workshop. It's uh, I would do it over again, and I should have done it much earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it's pianos around here in this country that uh, people want to get rid of. Last yeah, we year, have that as last well. Last year, I yeah, last year I threw a, mahon- a mahogany bom- um, piano on a bonfire. I didn't have chance to strip the wood off it, and the owner wanted it gone, so it just had to go on a bonfire, and that was that. That's the same in Norway, and of course, because of that huge metal plate for keeping the string tensioners and so on, it's they are so heavy. So people are actually giving away a lot more pianos than organs just for someone to come and take them away from them but i have seen a pattern now because there's a there's a swedish youtuber harvesting pianos so i see there are like maybe on the border (laughs) towards sweden it starts to get a bit low on pianos Uh, i don't know if it's a correlation there but uh that could very much be be something i think is it uk jay are you doing it no no definitely not (laughs) <laughs> it's one of the, one of those things that it's actually nice to have a uh, to not be that uh, that good on some things like music for instance that i mean i can i can make some sounds on on like a piano and that and and maybe get some kind of tune out of it but i'm i can't really play it and the string instruments are out of the question so that's that entry level is so high that it's not really worth it to to dive into that for me and it's the same thing with uh with painting and all those things because i'm colorblind so doing anything with with colors that it, it probably doesn't look the same in other people's I that is does for me so <laughs> so just I know no that's not for me and um, that <laughs> limits the options that's that can be really nice in in a sense so you don't have to think oh should I do this should I do that but no no other people can do do those those things yeah you have enough on your plate that is this <laughs> I've not got a musical bone in my body at all I've got no natural rhythm either but um, it's, it's been quite challenging. I mean, I've got three musical instrument builds on my channel. Yeah. And I, Why is you know, that? I <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I like making them. I just, I just can't play them. I can't test them. I mean, when I when I made the cajon, I actually made a, a pair, but I only showed one being made on um, on camera. You know, and I was making this thing, and I just kept going around gingerly tapping it on the sides just to see whether it had an interesting sound. <laughs> <laughs> And then I, when uh, when they were done, and I, I called my friend over, and he just went to town on this thing, and it was just fantastic. I thought, yeah, you did it. Another one done. <laughs> Another one worked. Yeah, musical instruments, that's basically making interesting sounds in tune. That's yeah. the, the whole thing of it, as far as I can see. The, 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 yeah, the a, important part there's a, there's is the tune. There's a difference between noise and sound, though. <laughs> I'm no musician, but I have played a lot of guitar and bass, but I realized at an early point that you can just go so far just sitting in your room playing for yourself um, before it's that natural step to playing with somebody to hone that skill to actually play in tune with someone else. But that never was something I wanted to do because, all right, then you have to turn up at a place regularly (laughs) with someone that you go along with. And 
I realized that everyone else had ambitions of, well, we want to be well-known, we want to live off the music, we want to travel around playing and so on, and I don't want to do that. It's the same with practicing sport. I mean, it, it's fun to play football in in school and so on, but it very quickly becomes that threshold that, all right, but now you should start playing on a team and then we have to practice on Tuesdays and Thursday and every second weekend we have to go and play games. And then, of course, the the coaches are just spotting for the talents. So if you're just doing it for the fun, but you don't have any big ambitions, then you won't get any focus. So you will have no development. And I kind of felt it was the same way because I just wanted to, well, why can't we just meet up every now and then and play and have a laugh? But nobody was interested in keeping it at that level. And then you stranded sitting by yourself, playing to backing tracks and so on. And, that becomes boring to me after a while. So then I stumbled into building the guitars instead. So I have a couple of guitars on the wall that I built myself, but I find that more pleasurable <laughs> than actually playing them. <laughs> did you did you build them uh, from scratch, the, the neck and No, not the neck. Um that seems to be the no problem people the don't neck, like to do on the guitar. Like... I, I have the tool <laughs> I have the tools. Uh I came that far but I didn't have a workshop for doing that properly. Um, yeah. Now I have, uh, but I haven't. There's so much else I want to do before I go back to building a guitar and actually doing the neck and everything. So, yeah. But at some point, <laughs> it will happen, I guess. So that's a, a sign that you're out of ideas when you start building a guitar. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> that's a fallback. It's a safety <laughs> net. <laughs> it's good to have those. How's that medieval uh, weapon coming along, KJ? Uh, well, as I said, I, I, I haven't. Sorry. I, I don't think I e I've even been inside the workshop the last week, so nothing oh, no. has happened on that front. Um, it's definitely been one of those weeks which I, I think someone has stolen a couple of hours because you can't possibly be twenty-four in each day. So yeah, <laughs> hopefully next week will be better. Yeah, I've not had a chance to do anything fun in my workshop this week. It's been on the utility room. I've uh, made some really good headway on that. It's had its first coat of paint tonight. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's good going. But um, all I've done in the workshop is mess it up, basically. No no fun projects. Hopefully this weekend I'll get to have a, a, quick, uh, a quick YouTube project and then back on to the next job inside. Have you made any progress on uh, buying a new laser yet? Obviously, Havard. <laughs> well, uh, no. Um, I've, if anything, I've dug a deeper hole for myself. Um, I, I think you mentioned Mungus is little. Yeah. And I just hit him up and asked if he were pleased with his uh, laser. And he was. And he gave me some inside knowledge, which just made me more interesting. But it's... Uh, it's a couple of steps up from yeah. what I initially thought I wanted. And of course, once you raise that bar, it's very hard to go down again. So uh, I had a bit of a budget break. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but did he, those did he looks get his... really good. And it's actually a Norwegian company who sells them, which is nice because oh, okay. a lot of the lasers I've seen are companies outside of Norway and it's sometimes difficult to negotiate them deducting the VAT because I have to pay that for importing it into Norway and if there are any problems with them, especially at that price range, it's it's hard to have a relationship with a yeah. company outside the country's borders. So if I have a company which is also fairly close by, it's much easier to do the deal. I was convinced he'd got it from the U.S. military. <laughs> well, it, uh, it really I looks didn't... the part, yeah. <laughs> the thing that stuff that that the stuff that that thing can do is unbelievable. It's so fast. Yeah, it's tremendous. Yeah, uh, I think the only limitations were the 
the said height, but then again, that will always be a limitation. That's the same on the CNC. There is a, no matter what the limit is, you always find something that's a centimeter too high that you want to jam in there. So yeah. that's really not nothing to be disconcerting about. Yeah. And then of course, some of them have like, you can open a front tray or something and you can feed longer materials through them. But I mean, I don't have the space for that anyway. I need to put it up into a corner. So that's a feature I would probably never use. So paying extra for that, yeah. I don't see the point in. Just modify it like Emily the engineer did with her 3D printer. Make <laughs> it a 10 foot high one. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, uh, <laughs> Manga Sisler, they actually mentioned that, that you could probably just cut an opening in the bottom there and modify it. But then again, it's the... Uh, a 9,000 pound plus equipment. So it's not the first thing you do to it, cut it open to <laughs> make some modifications to it. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you do with your old one. Yeah. When you got the new one. I would imagine if he took the bottom out of his lazy, he'd need to lay a couple of feet of concrete underneath it just so it doesn't burn through to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What about you, but, KJ? Any robots in your life? Did you have a word with Mrs. KJ and? Please, no, I no, I don't robot? feel. I don't feel a need for a robot at the moment. I, it mean, I mean, it would have been nice, but when you start looking at lasers, I mean, I, I, I did for, for a while, consider it. I thought, well, yeah, that would be nice. I wonder how much they are, and then you start looking at it at the entry level. That's, I mean, that's, it's not nothing, and then you realize that this is really the, the simplest, can do almost nothing at least at that point what you think that you're okay and i wanted to do this this and this oh now is the cost of a used car hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> that might not be the best investment and then you keep looking and you realize that i mean the sky is the limit when you again get into the the proper industrial versions and yeah and it just goes on and on and on i don't want to acknowledge this loudly to myself maybe but what i would use it mostly for was probably engraving or burning my logo onto other <laughs> things i made and you get the small handheld ones that are actually portable yeah. uh, instead of the like the heated ball iron um, so that would probably be something i would use more often yeah, so i, I, I think really it's, cheaply I do want it, but for that price, there are a lot of other tools I want, like a bandsaw, which yeah. now you, Glenn, have purchased. If yep. I'm... Hit the hit the buy button today. Ooh, that's always so a what... nice feeling. <laughs> what did you end up with? So I was um, had a really tricky decision between the Matibo, the one that Havard had, or the Record. Uh, bandsaw tabletop bandsaw and i went for the record one purely because it has a extra 100 watts of power hmm. yeah so it's a 500 watt one and i also bought a drill press as well today and i bought one that looks like a vards but is actually 100 quid cheaper it's the ship pack version is that how you say it yeah uh, yeah. And it's the it's basically the same one. It's made by the same company, uh, and yeah. I just found that after I bought the Bosch one, and the one you're getting, they don't have the wheel, but they have the spokes for yeah. uh, drilling down. And I would actually rather want that. So I I have actually been looking into modifying mine to get rid oh, of the okay. wheel because it it feels unnatural when you have used other drill presses. But, yeah, I would prefer yeah. spokes as well. Yeah, to have something more to to rest your arm on or something like that. So, yeah, I I uh, based my decision on the drill press purely, purely because it looks quite modern and not like the old drill presses. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually I, don't... I really like the old design of of drill presses. Yeah, I but, just... yeah. I, I mean, the drill press. If I had to choose one one piece of. Uh, bench or or floor standing equipment the the drill press is by far the most the ones i got most miles of out of so to say yeah it's the most useful one in my workshop 
And I really love the motor in it. It's you, you adjust the motor speed. Yeah. Uh, I had an old one with belts and pulleys yeah. and so on, but after a while they got slack and then it was an off-brand kind of thing. So I did not know where to get the spare pulleys and... So I just went with this one. I'm, I'm really pleased, but it is a hobby version, so it's not as precise for like metal machining, but it's yeah. never built for that. But for woodworking, it's really nice. And I've made some clamping arrangements and so on. So I'm really pleased with it now. Yeah, yours yours actually came out top in quite a few surveys. So that's obviously the one I didn't buy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I considered that when I uh, looked around, but I actually choose not to go down that road because I thought it was looked too ugly. <laughs> <laughs> My vanity said no. <laughs> Yours looks quite meaty, actually, K- KJ. Your drill press, that is. It's um, it looks a little a little bit industrial. Yeah, it's. I mean, they're they're trying to make it look that way, but it's just it's the it's a cheap brand uh, store brand. Oh, okay. uh, version so it's it's not really that much but it it works great for what i need it need it to do i mean you can chuck in one of those uh, uh, um, th- those rollers and make it to a half functioning spindle sander so to say um yeah and i mean i i'm i'm shit at a drilling straight holes with a handheld Real, so it's really great to have something that can give you at least close to ninety degrees holes. Yeah, definitely. Do the uh, googly eyes, uh, googly eyes, do they make it work more efficiently, or um, it makes me feel less bad when when I use uh, too big of a drill that's not sharp enough <laughs> because everything starts to shake, and then it looks kind of happy. But it doesn't sound happy at all. <laughs> I had to upgrade mine on some of the bigger. When I was trying to drill some bigger stuff, it just used to stop. It would just grind to a halt, and the motor would just make this awful sound. So you'd have to quickly hit the stop button before something burnt out on it. So yeah, that was, that was the reason for getting a new one. That and it's quite wobbly as well. It doesn't drill a straight hole really for a, for a drill press. <laughs> well, then it's not really useful. No. <laughs> <laughs> But on, on the subject of, of drills, one thing that I really should learn is how to properly sharpen a drill bit. Because I'm really... I mean, I, I can't really say that I'm bad at it because I never do it. I mean, that's the that's the part I'm bad at. I generally just, oh, this, this one is, is not sharp. Well, I put it in this drawer and buy a new one. And then that <laughs> just... Just goes on and on and on, and if I just learn how to to sharpen them, I mean that it would be really good, especially for the bigger ones. I mean the small ones, the I mean the three mil and down, those are more expendable. But when you talk about thirteen, fifteen, twenty millimeters, those are, I mean, they're quite meaty. They can't be that hard to actually sharpen if you know what you're doing. <laughs> I was actually thinking about getting. Uh, because you actually get a, a sharpening machine, almost like a pencil sharpener. But I thought the price didn't actually correspond to my use because as you, I just throw them away when they're blunt and then I get some new ones because the smaller ones, and especially for woodworking, are fairly cheap. But I see when I get a bench press and a more metal-oriented workshop, then you also will start using bigger drill bits and those are also expensive in the quality that you actually need to drill in the materials and then it makes sense investing in the equipment for sharpening it because you'll save it in on not throwing away a couple of drill bits every now and then when i made the uh, last strum stick the aluminium one i had a few um, i had to drill some small holes three or four millimeter holes and some of the cheaper metal bits that i had just completely melted down just going through very you know very thin aluminium and i went out and bought some um, bosch some expert bosch um, metal bits and the difference was night and day they're absolutely fantastic so i 
I, I would never ever have considered sharpening drill bits before, but you know, having spent a little bit more on them, and if they, if you can get a good edge on them again, then maybe it's worth considering. But most of the bits I've bought, I'd just throw away and buy another set. Yeah, but in, that's pretty standard, I think. You just buy something cheap, and then it works for a couple of of tries, and then you get a new one instead of of working out for something that's actually good. Yeah. Yeah, and then the problem is, it's always cheaper to buy a set than the actual specific drill bit that you need. So I always end up buying sets, and I've it's always the three millimeter and the six millimeter that I'm mostly using for pre-drilling holes, and that's the one who gets lost or broken, and then I buy new sets. So I have a lot of drill bits for all the other sizes, which I never use. <laughs> Yeah, I try to buy them in bulk, uh, find like a, a set of 10 pieces or something like that for the 3, 4, 5 mil size. Just because you know that if not anything else, they will get lost because they're so small. Yeah, yeah, I did the same for, I think I needed some 2 millimeters for a project, project and I knew I was going to break one or two of them, so I bought a set of a million or something for a dollar on AliExpress. So uh, I'm, I'm covered in that division. <laughs> for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. do, you get, do you get through one, one drill bit per hole at that? Because the quality is so crap. You might get two holes out of them, but yeah, the durability of those aren't really good. And I must say I have, I think the last week I've broken two... Uh, router bits for the CNC, which I, I have uh, two millimeter ones, but I'm really impressed you how much you can push them before they break. At that point, I also have some one and a half millimeter ones, but then it starts getting troublesome. If you hit a knot or something in the wood, they snap. <laughs> That's basically a needle. Yeah. <laughs> When you're going with the CNC and a, on a uh, with the router bit that small, do you have to just take it very shallow passes at a time and slow it down, or I take relatively sh shallow passes, but not too shallow because, uh, well, depending if you have a downward cutting or upward cutting, but you have to go down with the fee rate, and then but it's very nice. It's actually very often on a lot of the the packages you actually see a graph for how fast the feed rate can be in comparison with the rotational speed and also with different materials and so on so you you have a range that you can keep yourself within but for the the thinner bits i found to keep at the lower end of the scale works for me at least did you uh and what were you uh making did you manage to make something with the uh, CNC? <laughs> well, we had, uh, I think it was a couple of episodes ago now that uh, we all were ranting about how we dislike teak, um, despite the fact that we actually all have some laying around. And then a really good friend of mine just hit me up, well, you could make me something out of teak. And uh, I did. So I make a, I made a sign out of teak that actually says something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ultimate <laughs> dad joke. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was a really nice material to work with on the CNC because the, um, the edges became really crisp. And I did minimal sanding and then I just oiled it and glued it together. So it was uh, really nice. So. It felt like a, a, the first in a series of something, anything, nothing, <laughs> a thing. Yeah. Um, Fishing. <laughs> <laughs> One of my more frequent uh, commentators on my YouTube channel actually asked or said she hoped that I kept the, the inverted part where the letters were cut out from. And I actually did. And I started thinking, well, Maybe I should make a piece out of that and call that something else. <laughs> <laughs> something but then it starts nothing. getting a bit meta. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
what was your friend's reaction to it when you gave it to them? <laughs> she loved it. Uh, <laughs> she I mean, she really didn't you, expect so. that. Yeah. <laughs> and we were actually going to have a cup of coffee on Saturday. So I was really working on getting it finished to then, but then she had to cancel because she was also going in a birthday. So uh, the, the timetable just didn't add up. Oh. And luckily for me, I was actually a day behind, so I didn't complete it until Sunday. So that's a good match. So uh, I'll hand it over at our next uh, coffee meetup. <laughs> Brilliant. That was such a fun project. <laughs> And that's that's a, that's the kind of projects that throws up my plan if I had one because I can do a project and then this happens and I get an idea and I just have to get it out of the way or else it eats up brain capacity. So uh, yeah. this one I just needed to get done and out of the way and now I can be back <laughs> on track. And then of course I stumbled over an organ so now i have that so <laughs> there's a lot of bumps in your road I think. yeah <laughs> we're talking I wonder about who put them there <laughs> talking about projects you know we were talking about the knife along did you see old the uh, not old uh, mellow fires joke entry on the instagram that he sent us yeah rather <laughs> scary <laughs> I've never thought of attaching one to a motor. I mean, that that could be uh, in the guillotine department as well, as we spoke about. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. That that actually got me thinking about the saying, "Don't bring a a knife to a gunfight." And I was thinking that if we were going to have a knife off, <laughs> I was thinking I'm going to go in a completely different direction and when we were presenting our projects and you presented your knives i would say well you don't bring a knife to a gunfight or vice versa and then i would have some sort of uh uh well knife firing gun or something but <laughs> then i started thinking that that sounds awfully familiar and then of course that was done not very long ago <laughs> by another YouTuber. So that's, uh, well, that's <laughs> out of the question. Have to think of something new. Yeah, I mean, the backyard scientists did some rocket-powered knives a while oh yeah. ago oh, as well. Those were brilliant. <laughs> those were proper scary. <laughs> yeah, he does some really, uh, yeah, yeah questionable uh <laughs> yeah. projects but then again he is one of the lucrative club of youtubers who actually had fbi knocking on the door <laughs> so <laughs> i mean that's a that's a next level bar to pass have the authorities to knock on your door for a friendly chat <laughs> And of course, they started with asking the question, do you know why we are here? And he asked, oh, is it because of the exploding something? And they just said, the exploding what? Oh, <laughs> you're not here about that? Oh, for, forget about it. Nothing. <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> well, I, I guess you, 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 Florida has some not so strict rules about you what you're allowed to do because florida seems like an in in some aspects an awful place to to live in <laughs> yeah uh, i don't think for a lot of reasons florida is not for me but uh yeah well in the outback swamps uh, nobody really cares about what you're doing so in some aspects it's nice i guess i quite enjoy disney in florida <laughs> Many years ago, Disney and um, International Drive for all the shopping. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was interesting walking around Disney. If ever you get a chance to go to Disney in Florida, if you, while you're walking around, if you just look up, you can see men with guns patrolling. <laughs> it takes <laughs> takes the whole shine off of it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think they, they must bank on putting so many distractions at eye level and below that you're not supposed to look up and spot these guys with the guns. <laughs> it, 
it still feels weird as a Norwegian traveling abroad. Yeah. Seeing fully armed police because yeah. the police here are not armed unless there's a specific reason for actually doing so. So, uh, and that also leads to the gun crimes being low because even though if even though your business is crime and you're doing a heist or something, then you don't really need weaponry for that because you know that the police will not have that and will not fire at you. So it's yeah. <laughs> it's a more safer operation to be a criminal in Norway than yeah. uh, in other places. Is that the same but, in Sweden? Yeah, yeah, more or less, more or less. I mean, the I mean, sure, we have some gang criminals at the moment trying to fight about the the drug dealing that sort of thing but in general most of the weapons in sweden are, are for hunting or i guess the military so we're not not even close i mean i, I had that feeling when i went from from make your central home you, you get to the birmingham airport there were some guards going around with uh, uh, some submachine guns and then yeah, you get yeah. i get to brussels and there were they were even more heavily armed, and then I get to to Stockholm, and it wasn't even a passport control. You just there was really? some policemen standing around, just keeping it. Yeah, <laughs> those are pe- people walking by. I mean, they had a yeah. st- standard sidearm, but they looked really oh. casual, just sitting around, more or less having a coffee, having a chat, just keeping half an eye on the people walking by. Yeah, but, I, yeah I it's, think it's different in different places. I think per capita, Norway is quite high up on the list because we have a lot of weapons, but it's for hunting purposes only, and it's yeah, very. You have to you have to count in Svalbard as well. Yeah, <laughs> where it's that more as or less well. standard practice to have to have something with you. And I actually, uh, I went to Canada uh, to paddle the Yukon River uh, a few years ago, and then I brought my shotgun with me because you are advised to do so because of it being bear country and there are no other people around. And I remember traveling with a firearm, at least at that time, uh, was a bit cumbersome. There was a lot of paperwork, of course, and you had to have the gun uh, separate from the ammunition. And then the gun should also be broken up into at least two different pieces. So it shouldn't be working uh, and then put in different kind of luggages. So the, the weapon and the ammunition was three different parts of luggage. And then, of course, you checked it in and you had to fill out even more forms and so on. And then, of course, we flew over to Canada. And from, I think it was Calgary Airport, uh, I was going to take a small prop airplane into Whitehorse. But Canada is very much like Norway, but they have even stronger hunting culture so when i came to calgary airport i was of course in the transit area because i was going to take a plane further out in the bush and then when i came there they just handed me all my luggage and then i went through the airport full of people and with all my luggage i had the weapon i had the ammunition everything just stacked on top of my trolley and i was just strolling around the fully populated (laughs) airport and when I approached the desk for uh, checking in to to the airplane for Yukon, I just looked at my luggage. Uh, ah, you're going to Whitehorse. And then they just started typing on the computer before I even presented my passport. So <laughs> they were really not uh, <laughs> concerned about someone showing up at the airport with a weapon. So it's it was fun to see the difference. So what, what's the shotgun for? What do you what do you have it for? At home, is it for sport or do you hunt or? Well, it's for hunting purposes, yeah. but I haven't, I haven't used it for years, basically. So it's just sitting, collecting dust. So every now and then, I go to the shooting range just to confirm it still works and. Yeah, just to shoot the clay pigeons. Yeah. Yeah. Or That's bear cans or whatever. I mean. Yeah. Clay pigeons are hard to hit when you're not uh, <laughs> practicing regularly. <laughs> I used to uh, work at a garden centre years ago, and the owner there had uh, shotguns. And we also had a little bit of land at the back. And we used to take the trap up there, the machine to shoot the 
clay pigeons and I would set the clay pigeons off and he would shoot them. And I figured out that you could, where, wherever you place the pigeon on the trap to shoot it, it changed the position of where it went. And if you could get them to come just above his head when he shot them, he'd get covered in the clay. So <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my favourite things to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's so childish <laughs> I was a little bit younger then but I'd, I'd still do the same thing now <laughs> yeah, still, still would be funny yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where do we go from that? silence <laughs> it's not so scary now I know how to edit silence out <laughs> <laughs> no but that's so weird, that mechanism that you can do things flawlessly as long as there's no pressure. It's uh, yeah. like when I did the recordings uh, for the organ or if it's anything for a YouTube video, if you, if you try it a couple of times and all right, now I know how to do it. And then you set up the camera and you press record and two seconds in, it's like, fuck. And then you just, <laughs> okay, I press record again and then you start to become more painfully obvious that, oh, this is the 300 times I'm trying to record this and then the pressure adds up and then yeah. at some point you just have to call it a night. I'm not doing this today. And then <laughs> yeah. I've had real difficulty talking to camera and, um, you know, convincing my face that looking at the camera is a happy thing and not, I don't hate it. Um, but um, I've, I've realize that if I can find the process funny I'm okay with it so I did a video on uh, installing a camera a light burn camera on the laser and it was just the whole thing was just so ludicrous to me because I was doing a tech video <laughs> on some, <laughs> I mean something. you're such a tech bro I know right <laughs> uh, it just it just I, it made the whole process quite pleasurable I actually enjoyed doing that and I don't mind watching myself on that and again when we started doing the um did a few things for our Instagram account. I did the, the the first take and really fluffed up my lines and it made me laugh. And then I was okay. I could do it again after that. So just finding the funny side for me that gets me through it. I must say that within the last year, talking to the camera has become, well, it, it feels more natural or I don't think as much about it. I remember the first videos, there was a lot of silences and then, I felt comfortable doing the voiceover afterwards, but I kind of transitioned into just talking directly while I'm filming and then also film myself while I'm talking and doing stuff. And it really helped when I got the new camera because there was some issues using the phone because it was very hard to know where to focus because the lens is so small. So if you just looked a couple of centimeters to the left or right, it didn't look like you were looking into the camera. But when I got the new camera, it feels like uh, Hal in a space odyssey, just sitting there <laughs> for myself, talking into this black void of a lens. I think you find your words quite funny. At the, often when you get to the end of your videos, you give a little chuckle, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's and a fair bit a... of chuckling, but I mean, that's yeah. part of the charm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've... I've... If I don't find it funny myself, that and I struggle. <laughs> who else will find it? Who else is going to find it funny? And uh, at least what I do, I can't try to pose any uh, <laughs> any seriousness <laughs> onto it. So it's better to laugh at it. Absolutely. How are you with it, KJ? Well, I I have no no problem standing in in front of a camera. Uh, for me, it's it's more to do with delivering the lines the way I imagine it, because that takes a couple of takes, yeah. uh, and then when I finally get the words out in the in the proper order with the proper pronunciation, uh, I have lost all the energy. So then I have to do a couple of takes <laughs> again where I s smile up and, and actually. Uh, make it sound like it's worth <laughs> worth watching i think some of your best stuff's actually when um 
on your Instagram when you've been having a lot of fun with it, like throwing the stickers or modeling the um, modeling that uh, welding sleeves. You just look like you're having a heck of a time with it all. It's just, it's just hilarious to you. you. You've really come across well on those. Yeah, I mean, those are, are for some reason, I get into that it has to be perfect ish when it's a, a proper video. But I don't really know why. Uh, you should. I should really be be better at just uh, just le- letting it go and and letting it be what it becomes. Yeah. Yeah, I've struggled with that as well. At some point, I should. I can make thirty takes until there's one that I'm happy with and then of course i can spend a lot of time in editing cutting various clips together but it takes so much time and energy to get it to that level and it's just to find three video clips to cut together because i mispronounced one word that i'm not happy with that someone else would probably not even think about because they are watching the video for what i'm actually doing not the exact words i'm saying here and there so that's a that's a struggle getting past that because that will greatly reduce the time i do for making and then editing the videos because there is a bit of difference doing youtube um i have also done a couple of shows where i've been on stage and there you have a script and you rehearse it to the point where you are really sick of it and then you rehearse more because you need to get to that level that you're not only getting it right but you can't really do it wrong no matter what and then when you then go up onto the stage for the first time with the audience then the joy comes back because then yeah it's something completely different but then you also have weeks and weeks of actually practicing your monologue in your car and you're having uh, like you read together with the other casts several times a week but you don't do that for youtube videos and having a camera where you can press start and stop recording and go over again it really changes that dynamics and what you don't have there either is you have to imagine the audience behind the camera because you don't have a director or a camera person who can be the the audience on site so to say you have to imagine all of that yourself <laughs> if someone else was standing behind the camera and could actually be the one reacting then they could be a stand in for the audience <laughs> yeah you'd be the same thing as having the 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 audience at the at the theater but now it's just what i imagine and and you are all sane people are their own worst critic i would say yeah i remember laura Kump's videos when she did everything herself which are brilliantly executed but when she got felix in which is a brilliant maker of his own as the cameraman she automatically automatically gets an audience that gives her direct feedback and you can see her videos become much better just having one person there as an audience and doing the filming i disagree and of course the... I, I preferred her videos before felix i'm in both camps because i like the 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 more arty shorter tighter of her her early videos, but I also like the happier laughing uh, human you see yeah. in her newer videos the, because the... you actually get to see her more of her. Did you see so the I, I, latest I like, one? I like both. You see the latest one in LA where she walks nine miles for a free map. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I thought that was executed really well. I thought that was really entertaining video. Yeah. It was nice to see the 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 backside of America that we all know are there, but yeah. it's seldom shown. It yeah. really was the backside as well, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we did the same realization. We went to LA a few years ago, me and my wife, um, 
and we like when we are traveling around to walk everywhere and of course outside of the u.s that is normal but in la it's really a struggle we were going from the hotel one evening uh, just to a strip mall on the other side of the road and of course it was a four-lane road although in a domestic area but there was no road crossings there were no street lights letting people cross over there were maybe some street lights from the cars but i think but just that 200 meter walk to the shop was actually only possible by getting into your car and then driving (laughs) half a mile in one direction and then turning in an intersection and then going back again so that city is horrible for people not spending their entire day in a car and of course since we like to walk around you have to go the back roads to get to places and then you get to see the real LA because you don't have to take you maybe sidestep one or two streets from the main roads and you get a complete different world so that was an eye opener did you feel safe while you were walking those back streets yes Um, And that's, of course, being a Norwegian helps because, uh, and when you're walking around, it's no doubt that we are tourists. And of course, you can stumble over somebody who wants to rob you, but then, of course, you just give away your phone and your wallet and they will probably be on their way because there's more hassle if they have to hurt you. So other than that, most people just realize, oh, (laughs) he doesn't belong here, but it's obvious that we are not trespassing onto any area to cause trouble or to offend someone so worst case scenario someone might say to you i think you're in the wrong place and okay thank you for the information and you turn around and walk so we have traveled a lot and we have never had any bad encounters well that's good we um when i went to florida and i think it was in 2000 at one stage we did get off the beaten track and we, we were in the car at the time but it, it was awful and I thought if the car if the car broke down at that particular point I would absolutely be terrified I don't think it helped that we were getting some strange looks but we we did have a big um, three litre white convertible with gold wheels <laughs> I think he might have been drawing <laughs> another bit of extra attention <laughs> it's one of those situations you get off the plane and you go to pick up your car, you've just, you know, you've just ordered the compact and the guy knows you've been delayed. He knows you've been awake for at least 19 hours. I've got a special deal for you for an extra $100. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and of course, we had this lovely big convertible car in a country where it's too hot to have the roof down. It was far better to have it up with the air conditioning on. <laughs> so a complete waste of money. I, I... What's the deal with convertibles? I mean, when are there... I mean, they're only nice to just slow drive when the when the temperature is right, because you don't really want to go on the freeway with the top down, do you? I wouldn't have thought so. That's, I mean, I mean that, coming, that coming must from, be horrible. Coming from Sweden, you by default would never get a <laughs> convertible. No, no. <laughs> But yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Uh, I mean, on, on nice days, on slow winding roads, it's nice. Um, a childhood friend of mine had a convertible for a few years. And for those two days a year, when that was the car to drive, it was really nice. But other than that, on the freeway, it's really loud and noisy. And tunnels are a pain in the ass. And then, of course, the rain and general general weather so it's uh yeah i'll never spend money on a convertible i think i would always be embarrassed you know when you're going through a town and you have to stop at traffic lights and you've got your old man music blaring out (laughs) 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 or or the radio puts an embarrassing song on for you at the wrong time i just think it would be awful i would no not for me not the convertible i'll stick with the stick with the roof up (laughs) It sounds like we are getting done. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to wrap up? Me? Then I have to think about what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do we need to thank anyone this week? There has been a couple of shout-outs. 
I haven't written them down, of course, so I couldn't name anyone on the top of my head. <laughs> so that's for planning. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mellow Fire was good. He uh, so he did the entry for us, uh, <laughs> starting early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually have been talking. Yeah, we've not started, have we? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's way ahead. <laughs> you, get, you can just change the, the the year on the date and then it'll be fine. I'm not sure whether he made that knife though though or he's literally just glued a, a a kitchen knife to a motor. Well does that count? I, th- I have a sneaking suspicion it's something that is done in a different project that just fit into this. I don't ah, think it okay. was custom made as an entry for this, mm-hmm. but I if hope it were, not. kudos. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible yeah. for something like that. I've only seen one of his videos. He's a clever guy. He's, yeah, um... I've seen I've seen quite a lot of them. Uh, I just, as many YouTubers, I, I just stumbled across him and he commented on, I think it was my YouTube ply button, where he just asked if I could uh, make him one for his next milestone and i just replied oh i guess we can come to an arrangement and i see that he has done a like a subscription counter so i was thinking okay maybe we can put our heads together and i can make the plaque if you can do the boring programming bit and then we can have a youtube play button that actually congratulates you at the yeah, yeah. at any given time <laughs> the number you have that's a good one i i'd really like a play button i've recently been looking into it but i just can't get the parts cheaply enough here to be honest with you the only place i could find to get the parts from was from america and of course a 20 dollar kit turns into 70 dollars by the time it's landed in in the uk yeah but do you get them as kit as well or is it just the materials for actually making one from scratch well for for me it has to come as a kit because i don't know the individual parts for it i don't know i wouldn't know what to buy well, I might know someone with a CNC that could probably. Uh... <laughs> well, I'll have to have a think about that. <laughs> <laughs> How can I spin this? <laughs> yeah, of course, I'm not doing anything without it being a YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't that goes seem any saying. point nowadays, does there? <laughs> yeah. Just absolutely change your life. Maybe that's a niche. Just producing play buttons for other YouTubers <laughs> for for the smaller numbers. I mean, a hundred thousand isn't far away. Have you got a counter, KJ? Uh, I that's have it. a counter, but it's not plugged in because I was looking at it too much. Did you had yours made for you, didn't you? I got it at um, uh, a treasure trade. Ah, okay. Uh, last year, I think it was. I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember the guy. I follow him on Instagram, and I knew he was making them and selling them on. Um, yeah, John Etsy. made it. And when I when I checked it out, your your logo was on one. Yeah, it's a cool gift. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I I do my best not to to look at the numbers because <laughs> if I start to look at the numbers, I can't look away. So. <laughs> I remember when I first started talking to you, actually, KJ, you said when you got to 300 subscribers, there was going to be some sort of celebration. Yeah, I said that. And, and you've gone past that now, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did a celebration for my, my 100th, and then the 200th, just, I, I barely noticed it. And now I, I, I skipped past 300 as well, and that, <laughs> yeah, time was not on my side for that, that so, celebration. So we yeah, just, just postponed it. Shall I just not bring that up again then? Uh, you can next time we have some nice even numbers or something like that. <laughs> Maybe three three sixty five the full year. That, that might be something. <laughs> but it is really hard to get around because I use uh, the YouTube Studio function to answer and comments and so on. It's it's a really nice yeah. dashboard setup, but of course, dead front and center, it's the subscriber account. So. Every time you go in there to do anything, you're reminded that that's the number. <laughs> yeah. And that, of course, your mind is a traitor in that respect. So, okay, so there's two people who dropped off since yesterday. So, okay. And then 
now we're back at that number and then <laughs> so, so. i mean you, you you when you see a number you always want it to go up if it's yeah. sus- subscribers or a bank account or not my yeah. age though <laughs> that, that might be the only one where you don't want it to go up yeah that's true yeah but i i, I don't i think it was i think it was my mom who said it when every time you get a year older well the alternative is worse because yes, yeah. the age was will always go up and the day it doesn't then <laughs> you're not going back down so but it's it, yeah it's it's true that but it at the same time it doesn't seem like a fun race to win at this moment my my mom is in there all my friends are dead i'm the only one left god has forgotten about me <laughs> he was going to pick me up years ago but <laughs> yeah it's it's really hard to get your head around that but also it's my grandmother said that as well it's I have done all I set out to do. I've seen my grandchildren grow up, but I'm not going to be old enough to see their children grow up. And I'm so far away, I'm not a part of their day-to-day life. So I'm basically done. And as you said, uh, all her friends have passed away years ago. So she's just sitting there waiting and everyone in her well reference group is gone so she has really no one to talk to so it's uh for us it's it's hard to get our heads around that because well we still got things to do and we it's hard to imagine that you get to a point where you run out of things to do and you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs and all right it's time to call it quits yeah i mean the, the, the like thing this episode I... tonight <laughs> I was just about to say, can you remember what happened last week, guys? <laughs> I, I, Welcome to the after it. show. <laughs> Welcome to the afterlife. <laughs> Welcome to the afterlife. <laughs> That's a good one. No, the, the thing I, I take with me from that is is the good the good thing of having friends in different age brackets, because then you will have the ones who are much older than you that by natural causes will will go before you but you so yet you you're somewhat prepared for it but you also have have younger people that you know that will be still there so you're not the last one standing just because all your all your classmates mates are gone that you actually know people uh, at different ages and i think the the maker community can be really great for that because I mean, no one really cares about age in that sense in the maker community. No. You can be uh, you can be 14 years old or 74 and still have have, have things to, to say to each other. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Well, it didn't get as depressing as last time, but still, we ended on uh, life and death and all the big questions. Oh. Well, strictly speaking, we haven't ended yet. <laughs> <laughs> the end is where you choose to put it. Mm-hmm.